Greetings, fellow Empyreans. I am Ashtrothy, and I am back, baby. A week ago, I made a video called Should You Play Eve in 2023? Uh, and this video has become very, very popular, or three reasons to play Eve Online in 2023. It's been very popular. A lot of people have signed up. A lot of people have subscribed off of it. A lot of people have joined the, agree uh, the Alliance because of it. People have been digging it. And I've noticed just a ton of old school names showing up and, uh, you know, coming back to the game, both in Faction Warfare and elsewhere. We have a lot of people coming back to the game. And so I hear, like, the, the questions that I get asked a lot have actually shifted a lot towards from new player questions and more to, like, returning player questions. Because the problem is, is that a lot of huge, huge changes have happened in the last few years in EVE Online. Um, and because of all of the angst and scarcity and all that kind of stuff, a lot of the actual practical details of these things have either been lost or misrepresented in the public a lot. So, for the benefit of you guys, those of you who may be returning to EVE after some time, I felt that it would be important to go over all of the major things that I can think of that has changed in the game that will be relevant to you. Now, there is some things that have been added to the game, like new content, new like invasions and, and abyss and all that stuff. And we're probably going to touch on that a little bit, especially towards the end. But mostly I want to focus on things that you might expect to behave a certain way that don't expect to work that way anymore, or, or that are new ways of doing it. Updates, changes, rebalances, etc. So I have this divided into three different categories. We have it industry, other reworks, and the Triglavians. Okay, so let's get started with the market. The major one of the major selling features of the uh, of Eve Online is its markets. So everything in the game has to be built. Or, well, almost everything in the game is built by players. It's all traded by players. Uh, the markets are local, so you have to move things around. Logistics are a thing. The market and the simulation of the market is by far one of the biggest selling points of EVE Online, one of the things that makes EVE unique. However, there was a bit of a problem, which is that you could update your order once every five minutes, but when you updated your order, you could update your order by as little as 0 .01 isk granularity, or point, yeah, 0 .01 isk. What people would do is they would just go look at the cheapest order or the best order, you know, the current best order, and make it so that their order is 0.01 isk better, whether it's a buy order or a sell order, right? The people who won were the ones that were able to update it every five minutes, right? To keep their order being the best order, which is lead, lends itself, of course, to bots. But what this means is, is that the mar like the actual not like how to do market trading kind of gets lost in the sauce a little bit there, right? Because it's not necessarily about knowing how to do market trading. It's more about whether or not you can sit at the computer and update your orders often, often enough, more often than your opponent. And that's not really great. So what they did was they changed it. Now there's a limit on the precision. You have to have four significant figures, right? At, at, at maximum. If something is... 1,111,000, then you can't make it 111,000.1. You have to increment it by, make it so that there's four significant digits. In other words, without the zeros, right? So this makes it so that A, prices fluctuate way faster because changes position positions change in bigger increments. You know, when, when prices are going up, they're no longer going up in increments of 0.01 isk as it like slowly climbs the price thing, right? They have to go up by an increment that's based on its maximum amount, right? Secondly, they made it so that the broker fees were, were mandatory and they tweaked the broker fees to make it so that uh, tax havens were a little bit less. But the biggest one is this one. So now, rather than it being about 0.01 isking, it's now about fixed positions. So it costs more to put up and update your order, and you have less precision in how much you can update your order. 
So what that means is, is that you want to know, you want to make a good guess of how much you want to spend or how much you want to sell it for and put it up and hold your position as much as you possibly can. And that is way closer to the way that like real things happen. All right. Uh, okay. Next, along with the market, there's changes in how things are built. It begins with rocks. Once upon a time, like the distribution of resources was very much regional or at least racially done. And then over the years, it's kind of been uh, muddied a bit, especially as Nullsec Sov and, and the uh, iHub upgrades and all that stuff started being put in. Nullsec became increasingly independent, which caused them to turtle up and all this other stuff. What they did was they completely changed the way that the DNA of the rocks work, right? So it's all the same rocks, but what's in those rocks are different. The practical effect of this is that now Tritanium is basically the exclusive prov provider of, well, not tri not exclusive, but the major provider of Tritanium. Losec becomes the near exclusive source of Isogen and Noxium, which is, by the way, why you see that massive explosion of the price of, uh, of Isogen, because you have to mine it in Losec or Pakvin, which is uh, probably more dangerous than, than Losec. And then, of course, Zydrine, Megasite, and Morphite are the domain of Nullsec. And this is part of a larger thing. What you'll see is, is that over the last several years, one of the biggest things that CCP is focused on is the idea that trade is essential. Almost nobody has everything they need to be able to do what they want. You have to be able to trade things. So what this means is, is that like dense titanium becomes incredibly valuable because you can compress it and use it to ship a massive amount of titanium. Sorry, dense Veldspar is uh, uh, compressed dense Veldspar is very valuable because that allows you to export large amounts of titanium very efficiently, just as an example. Uh, likewise, all of the low sec ores become very valuable, etc., uh, etc. Et In addition to this, this has made it so a lot of the rocks have disappeared. So depending on where you are at in Nullsec, you may not find any real belts. You may only find desolate ore fields. Desolate ore fields are basically where belts used to be, but now there's no rocks that are eligible to spawn there anymore. The reason why they still exist is because that way uh, belt rats can still spawn. Uh, and like officer rats can still be done and all that kind of stuff. It's a long story. There was gate camping. A lot of people got mad, but now it's better. Each area of space has their own resources, which makes low sec extraordinarily valuable. Null sec is recovering uh, and high sec is actually pretty decent too now, especially for like the tier of people that would be doing that kind of stuff. Uh, as we can see here, like Veldspar has only Tritanium. You see a lot of stuff. All these minuses are minerals being removed uh, with pluses being added to. So we see this major rebalance of what kind of ore. Look at this. Dark Orker no longer has any titanium, but it does have a major amount of Mexilon uh, and a major amount of Isogen, so on and so forth, right? So huge amounts of changes to there. So if you're getting your resources, just realize that resources are now distributed based on security bands. This does also lead to another thing, which is if you want to get the, the rare good stuff, there is now rare good stuff. Just recently, i.e. about a month ago, uh, new ores were discovered. Ducinium, uh, Ephyrianum, Mordinium, and Yeterium. These four ores are only found in uh, blue stars and in systems adjacent, like at the boundaries, right? So like the, the high sex system, that's next to a low sex system or a high sex system that's next to a null sex system or a low sex system that's next to a, a null sex system. These are the systems that can potentially spawn these. They're still very rare, but they can spawn. But you can see this one comes with Megasite, which is normally null sec only, Zydrine, Pyrite, and Isogen. So Ethereum lets you get that Isogen, which is a low sec only mineral elsewhere other than uh, low sec. Now, this isn't enough to significantly change the market. Uh, as it turns out, but it is, it does make it so that you, as a person who needs to get some of this stuff, have other options for wh what you're doing when you're looking for these resources. As part of this whole effort, the other thing they did was take all of the significant minerals out of moon mining. So now moon mining is only moon goo with Mexilon and pyrite almost as like slag, right? So about half of your value of your moon goo, uh, R4 moon goo, like the high sec and wormhole moons, 
about half of the value of it will be in the Mexalon and Pyrite, and about half of it will be in the actual Moon Goo itself. However, our four moons have now become significantly more valuable. If you happen to be an industrialist, this is going to be your big thing, it, from, from extraction to production. So this is a significant, significant change to the way the industry happened. And this is one of the things that have caused prices to kind of go crazy all over the place, but not necessarily in the way that you might have heard it has. So uh, first and foremost, we now have compression. So it used to be that you would have to give your ore to the rock wall or take it to a station or whatever to do your compression. And you can only compress very specific things, like I think only asteroids or whatever. Now you can compress gas, you can compress ice or moon goo, all that stuff. And even fancier, you can actually compress it yourself in the belt as you're mining. So for instance, I can sit there in a Mackinac all day in a belt. And rather than having to continually jet can or something like that, every time my, my thing gets full, I just right click on the rocks, say compress, hit OK, and boom. Now, like all of my 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 room, like everything's now 10 times smaller or whatever it is. So that's cool. How do I do that? Well, they have changed industrial support ships to get further away from mining and towards support. So the one most hit by this was the rock wall. The rock wall was like the undisputed king of mining. But now, because of all of this uh, and the mining changes that happened, the rock wall is... I mean, it's still, it still can mine, but it is certainly, certainly better to mine with uh, mining barges supported by that. Uh, same with the orca and the porpoise. The major function or the additional major new function of these things is the fact that they can also use the compression, compression module. So an orca, a porpoise, or a rock wall with a compression module on that has sieged and used it because uh, they all now have an industry core that they have to use, which locks them in place. But when they do that and then they use the compressor, everyone within range of them can now just compress at will in their cargo hold for free, no problem. We have become so spoiled. It's it's ridiculous. I, if we have no compression for 10 minutes, we become such goddamn whiners in our, in our mining fleets. It's silly. However, uh, it is worth noting that not everything can compress everything. So Roqual can compress all of them. And then the orca and the porpoise can compress everything beside... Uh, oh, wait, I don't think... I think the porpoise had ice removed, right? So porpoises can't do ice, just gas and ore. Orcas can do all three. And then the rock wall can do all of them, I believe. I think that's how that works. Uh, is there a reason why they don't allow moon ore compression upwell structures? Uh, it has to be a refinery that has a refiner online. And I think that you can now, uh, I think that you can compress it under those conditions, if I remember correctly. Lots and lots of big changes, but what does this all do mean and why does this have to do with industry? Well, sorry, let me take a step back actually. Back to, for more mining stuff, the other thing that they did was they doubled the amount of uh, resources in the universe, but then they added in a new function called waste. The way that waste works, or sorry, residue, as it's now called, is that there is a chance, based on what equipment you're using, that when you mine, it will it will destroy twice as much resources as you get, right? So if I mine, and I have a 20% chance of waste, and I mine 100, unit, uh, 100 M3, then 20% of the time, I will get 100 M3, and an extra 100 M3 will be destroyed out of the rock. So a total of 200 M3 is removed from the rock, but I only get 100 M3 of it. The higher end the extraction, the higher end the mining equipment, the more waste it consumes. So you can mine things slowly and carefully, or you can mine things quickly and more, uh, more wastefully. And I think some of the state things here are actually kind of wrong, but... Uh, basically, the lower grade modules are like the slower stuff does a little bit of waste. Then the higher equipment does some waste and then the better crystals. They've also redone how crystals work. There's now three different kinds of crystals for each type of ore. There's basically a decent yield but low waste version. 
there's a high yield high waste version and then there's the offensive one the offensive one destroys like 13 times more miner more ore than it than it mines so it's it's designed so you can go into an enemy belt and just destroy their rocks so that is how uh, mining works now it ends up making mining actually pretty lucrative um, although nullsec has taken kind of a hit because they can no longer do it their, with their massive fleets of rock walls. But I thought this was the industry changes. Hold on a second. So once you get the rocks, what do you do? Well, there's been a significant update to industry. This significant update kind of boils down to a pretty simple answer, which is... Oh, they don't even have it here. All right, well, I'll just show you. Allow me to introduce you to reinforced carbon fiber. Reinforced carbon fiber is the new titanium. Yeah, T1 crystals, the T1A has no no residue, right? Also, fa you're right, faction modules have less residue as well. So there are ways of getting less residue, but in general, I like to think that, like, the bigger mining sh mining things generally take bigger bites and are wa more wasteful. That's just how I like to think about it. So reinforced carbon fiber. First of all, as you can see, now all capital parts, or not all capital parts, but a lot of capital parts now require a certain chunk of reinforced carbon fiber along with it. So this goes into it. What they ended up doing was they took basically all of the battleships and capital ships, took out about half of its titanium requirements, and put replaced the, that requirements with this reinforced carbon fiber and, uh, and other products. The major two things that these reinforced carbon fiber becomes are these auto-integrity preservation seals and life support backup units. These two materials are now necessary for all faction equipment, battleships, and uh, capital ships, okay? So if you look, if I look at the reinforced carbon fiber, you can see, like, literally every single faction ship in the game now at least takes some. However, Empire faction ships, that's all they pretty much take until you get to battleship and above. Pirate faction ships, though, require something even nastier when it comes to its cost. And this is why pirate ships are kind of expensive now. Let me introduce you to trigger neuralink conduits. These things are required for every uh, faction, capital, battleship, or I don't know if it's battleships. Yeah, uh, every capital and faction or uh, pirate faction ship require these things. In fact, the pirate faction ship requires two of types, at least. There's one of these per race, okay? There is RO, the SR, the UC, and the GO, which, of course, are, are conveniently colored by their race. So this is, you know, Mimitar, Galente, etc. Okay? So if you're going to be fitting, if you're going to be building, say, a Vigilant, right, which is a Serpentis ship. Serpentis is a mixture of Mimitar and Galente. So you're going to need those life support backup units, the auto integrity preservation seals, as well as both the Galente and the Mimitar trigger neural link conduits. Why is this a problem? Well, it's really these things that ends up being the problem. These uh, neural link enhancers are built by using two kinds of gas and these new condensers. The gas can be gotten in low sec and high sec, rarely in high sec, and the condensers can be gotten in high sec and low sec data sites. However, they are racially specific. So if I want this Celadron uh, Mycoceracin, I'm going to have to go to Mimitar space and mine and, and huff gas there. And then for the Viridian Mycoceracin, I'm going to need to go to Galente space to huff that. The CV composite molecular condenser in this case, I'm not sure if I'm correct about the location of those gases now that I think about it. But either way. It takes uh, these pieces, which are the molecular condensers. These are kind of weird. So these only drop in like the lowest end data sites available, mostly in what's called info shards. So you're not going to find these in NullSec. But what these do is because these things are so valuable now, it's made it so that high sec and low sec data sites are worth more than relic sites. We've had this kind of common truism that relic sites are better than data sites and that null sites are better than high sec sites. But these things technically make it so it's not true anymore. Data sites end up becoming pretty darn good, especially since we have the uh, the, um, the capital pieces. Hold on. 
there's a there's another piece that goes into uh, capitals and super capitals. Oh yeah, it's right here. Just the Neuralink protection cell. The Neuralink protection cell. Um, these things come from ghost sites. So now when you go to a ghost site, there used to be four cans. Now there's a fifth can. And that fifth can almost always, at least in low sec, rarely in high sec, has one of these Neuralink protection cells. And I think that there's even a better version of it. Oh, sorry. The electroneural st uh, signaler, I think, is the one in low sec and high sec. And then the Neuralink protection cell, I believe, is the one in wormhole space. Either way, the point is, is that all these things now require exploration and gas huffing, which is what causes these things to be incredibly valuable. They've also made it so that ventures can gas huff, which makes gas huffing the most profitable way for alphas to mine, right? If you're an alpha, it's always been like, oh man, I can't get a mining barge, so therefore I can't mine very well. And I always say that my, like alphas are, resource, are, 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 are consumers, not producers. However, alphas can actually gas huff, which if you go out with Luke Spoons over there, Lunic Spoons over there, uh, he will help you make a fortune. It's a little bit expensive uh, to get the skill book, but it pays off very, very quickly if you're willing to uh, do what it takes to get it. Oh, it'll explode if the NPCs appear too. It appears, it, it, they explode sh a, a few seconds after they appear. Oh, I see what you're saying. The top can doesn't explode just by them showing up. It only explodes if you fail the can. That's cool. So as you can see, industry's gotten a lot crazier, but how, how do we get this shit, right? Reinforced carbon fibers, ash, what, what, uh, what, huh? Remember how I told you that R4 moon goo is worth more now? This is why. So if we go back to the reinforced carbon fiber, we can see that what's really happening here is that it's a reaction. This reaction requires carbon fiber, oxy uh, organic solvents, and thermal setting polymer. Carbon fiber is made by hydrocarbons evaporate deposits. Our oxyorganic solvents are made by hydrocarbons and atmospheric gases. And uh, thermal setting polymer is made by atmospheric gases and silicates. Now, there is one other thing to this, which is uh Pressurized oxidizers, which is kind of like the, the other side of the coin from reinforced carbon fibers. And these require uh, sulfuric acid, which takes atmospheric gases and evaporate deposits. So what this means is, is that basically R4 moon goo, those high sec moons, right? All of them produce the stuff. If you take all of the stuff that comes out of the R4, those products, I think there's four of them. There might be a fifth. I think there's four. Atmospheric gases, evaporate deposits, hydrocarbons, and silicates. There you go. There you go. All four. I believe that's it. Um, if you take those four products and you react them together in different ways, you end up with reinforced carbon fibers or pressurized oxidizers, which then becomes everything else. So what have they really done here? It used to be that tech one industry was dirt simple and tech two industry was painfully complicated and there was no step in between. Now there is a step in between. Faction ships, battleships, and capital ships are now that step in between where they do take reactions like tech two does, but rather than requiring react all different kinds of reactions depending on what it is that you're trying to make, they all take the same reaction stuff, right? So I can just sit here and just like, I don't even need to know what we're building. I'm just, my job is to crank out reinforced carbon fibers and turn them into life support, auto integrity preservation seals and life support backup units to be able to build ships. This gives us something to step up from. It's not just minerals and BPC becomes a ship and it's not just, or and it's not all the way to, oh my God, I need to invent. I need to get all these moon goo. I need to react all that shit. I need to get it all together. I need to build the T1. I need to put it all like that. That's a huge leap. So now there's this kind of middle ground where you can get comfortable with reactions. You can kind of step up your game a little bit uh, without jumping fully into T2, which I think is really good and has helped a lot of our industrialists get into it deeper. Cool. All right, that's it for industry. So let's go into revamped systems. First, revamped daily reward tracks. 
uh, you may actually be so gone or have been gone so long that you didn't even know that we had daily rewards, but now we do. When you log in, uh, you get a daily reward track that every day you log in, you kind of work down the thing. There's different stuff that comes up. There's different qualities, you know, whatever. Now, originally they gave you really crappy BPCs, temporary effect skins, and some like basic boosters and stuff. And then, like, after you got enough, you would get 150,000 skill points, like, after so many logins or whatever. They recently changed it, so that way the rewards are way, way better. And better enough that you should be aware of them. We've got kind of three different basic things, I think. Is it three? Well, four, technically. But three big ones. One is the boosters. Now, these boosters are crazy. Just absolutely crazy. Bonker sauce. Let's look at this. So we have the Halcyon B, G, R, and Y, which are, of course, based on the races. You've got blue, green, red, yellow. The B boosters do shield resistance, warp speed, and acceleration, optimal range and fall off, missile flight time, capacitor capacity, drone hit points, blah, 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 blah. So this has a bunch of stuff, and all of them are like that. And they go from 1% all the way up to 5%, right? Uh, and, and so these things are almost always useful to you in one way or another. And they just show up here in your login rewards like this one. But the thing is that they expire very quickly. They, they expire in a week. And you can't turn them into a physical item. They apply automatically. So it's one of those things that like you got to find opportunities to use them. Otherwise, they go away. On top of that, they have the new uh, skins. So they have the Halcyon Dawn skins which are basically like the bio, bio security skins, but gold. They have the Carmine Horizon skin for a few ships, which is kind of pretty. And then the other thing that they've done is every all of the skins that were part of some other event or thing that can't be gotten anymore are now have a rare chance of dropping. So guess what? I have this skin because I went to Eve Vegas in 2019. It is incredibly difficult to get this skin otherwise. It is very expensive. It's very nice. It's one of the most coveted skins in the game. Uh, a year ago, I would have told you that you should just give up on any idea of ever getting this skin. You just, just don't even worry about it. But now, there is a small chance for you to get this skin as your pack. You can get this skin. You can get Purity of the Throne skins. You can get the, the Doctor Who skins. Yes, there was a Doctor Who event. Don't worry about it. We're moving on. Uh, you know, like, so So you can, if you've ever, like, longed for these skins that are, like, part of bygone days, they are now technically, now along the timeline, available to you once again, which is pretty cool. And then finally, they give uh, skill points and uh, filaments as well. Doctor Who. <laughs> That's, that is a story for another day. I will say this, though. The Doctor Who sites were really, really fun. Next. They rebalance strategic cruisers. If you uh, have ever wanted to fly T3 cruisers or you like T3 cruisers, guess what? They are cool. The biggest change, I'm just going to put it on the surface, the biggest change that has happened is that now you no longer lose skill points for losing a, a, a T3 cruiser. Yay! In fact, I in fact, because of this change, it is now actually impossible to lose skill points in Eve involuntarily. The only way to lose skill points now is by extracting it out of your own brain with an, with a skill extractor. Oh yeah, there's skill extractors. We'll get to that. Actually, I think I left that off the list ironically enough. <laughs> Uh, the other thing that's worth noting is that T3 cruisers have had their one of their subsystems collapsed, so now they only have four subsystems instead of three. Oh, sorry, four subsystems instead of five. And the balance has been that the Tengu is no longer the Indisputed King. It's still okay. Uh, the Loki is great. I'm loving the Proteus, and the Legion's pretty good too. But the Loki is the clear winner of this one, Okay. Yes, it used to be that when you, when you lost a T3 cruiser, you would lose a rank in one of the T3 cruiser skills that, you, that control that ship. Next, for those of you who live in Nullsec and get around, I've kind of left this about halfway through the thing 
because I wanted to only reward the people that made it this far because this is the one that's going to kill you if you don't know about it. You ready? All of your interdiction nullified ships no longer work. There is no such thing as passive interdiction nullification on any ship except shuttles now have interdiction nullification. All shuttles, every single shuttle is now interdiction nullified. However, no other ship is interdiction nullified by default. They have a new module called the interdiction nullification module that will allow you to be interdiction nullified for a short period of time. You can use this while you're cloaked. Ships that had uh, interdiction nullification bonuses before now have bonuses for the cooldown time on this on on that module. So that way you can use it every jump or whatever. Uh, but yeah, you have to actively hit it at the correct time or it doesn't work. What's even funnier is that that's also true about warp core stabilizers now. There is no such thing as stabbing up, you know, you know that old image of like the cow mill ship with like warp cores, like the, the condor with warp cores in every single slot, high slot, mid slot, low slot. Can't do that anymore. Well, you couldn't do that before, but you can't load up your low slots with warp core stabs anymore. You can fit one. And that one can be activated for 10 seconds and it gives you two points of work course stability. What does this mean? Well, that means that a Mollus Navy issue with its plus two points to scram, plus two points of scram, it beats your defenses. If you have uh, any normal ship and you have a warp course stab and you use it, you get three points, right? But if somebody has any bonuses at all, any bonuses at all, because their scram is two. So if they have a faction point or whatever, they can still point you. They can still scram you. Uh, and even if you're in a ship with built-in warp core stability, a venture or a bustard or something like that, they have two points of warp core stability. But wait, let's do the math. A faction scram on a Mollus Navy issue is five points of scram. Uh-oh. It no longer matters. A Mollus Navy issue with a faction scram can now scram anything in the game and it will not get away. It cannot warp. Does not matter. There's nothing you can do about it. There's no amount of stability. So enjoy that. Now, you, you still can use warp core stabilizers because often people don't bring more than one scram or, you know, whatever. There's still opportunities to use it. However, not only does it still have all of its drawbacks, it actually now has more drawbacks because it cuts your bandwidth of your drone bay or of your drone bandwidth in half. So now you get half as many drones to use. And to make matters worse, all of these penalties also exist on the interdiction nullification module. If we look at the interdiction nullifier, we can see that it also cuts your bandwidth of your drones in half, cuts, cuts your scan resolution in half. Cuts your maximum target range bonus in half. This is just to have this thing. So your interceptors that use inter inter interdiction nullification are no longer are going to have a 50% uh, cutoff from their scan resolution. Well, actually, hold on. 80% reduction in interdiction nullification reactivation de delay, max lock range penalty, and scan resolution penalty. The interceptors don't get as much of a penalty on those things, but they still do get some penalty just by having the interdiction nullification. And it also increases their interdiction nullification duration by 100%. So this is how they kind of resolved it, is that the ships that were really, really, really good at interdiction nullification now has these bonuses. However, the number of ships that can use interdiction nullification has increased. They can be fit to interceptors, blockade runners, deep space transports, strategic cruisers, uh, the yacht, covert ops, and haulers. By the way, industry ships are now called haulers. So... Pretty much all of the hauling ships and the, the ships that could use it before now can use interdiction nullification. And of course, they can use warp core stability. I think everybody can still use warp core stability, but it's also not that great anymore. You also, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. If you have an ECM burst on, you can't use the nullifier either. That's true too. So that's, that's, that's the important one that I wanted to make sure that I warned you guys about. Because that's the one that gets people killed for not knowing. Speaking of killing, let's talk about structures. So some of you may not, if you're old enough, you may not even realize that they, they have basically completely replaced the PAW system with uh, a new thing called upwell structures. Upwell structures are player structures that can be built. They're 
giant cities in space. They're really cool. However, they get three reinforcement or two reinforcement timers, right? So you, you strip down their shields, they reinforce, you come back for the armor timer, you beat the armor timer, they reinforce, you come back for the structure timer, then it blows up, okay? At least that's how it was for a while. Now, medium structures, which are the ones that most people use, right? The, one, the medium structures cost about a billion or so each to put down. They're the ones that most people live out of, and now they only have one timer. So the person shows up, they strip off your shields, then they come back a few days later, and they blow up blow up the, sh the, the structure. This includes in wormhole space, which, of course, wormhole space, normally structures have a thing called asset safety, which means when a structure becomes blown up, all of your stuff that's in there gets thrown into asset safety, which then you can pull out in various different ways. It's either very cheap if it's in the same system, or it's like 20% if, it's, if they have to asset safety it to the nearest low-sec system for you. However, wormhole space doesn't get this at all. When, uh, when a structure blows up, it's a giant loop pinata, which is pretty funny. And now they have that one timer, right? So in wormhole space, you can hit a structure and get a three-day timer and then come back in three days and congratulations, it's now your loot. That's a big deal. Uh, and it's changed the way that w whether or not people or how people can live in wormhole space. But, you know, people have kind of adopted to it. There is a second problem, which is that if a player, if a, if a structure goes unfueled for more than a week, in other words, the structure is not doing anything productive. It has no industry going. It has no clone bay going. It has no, it's not mining any moons or anything like that. It is just sitting there. After seven days, it becomes abandoned. And when it becomes abandoned, all of its asset safety defenses get turned off and all of its reinforcements get turned off. So as soon as it goes abandoned, somebody can hit it, blow it up and loot all the crap. Uh, this is true in high sec, it's low sec and null sec everywhere. So your stuff is not always safe. If you had stuff and now you don't and you don't know why, you might have left it in a player structure and it might have gone abandoned and it's now someone else's. If you see... Uh, in your asset window, you'll get a no well. In your notification window, you'll get a notification when things are about to go abandoned. You'll also get a no uh, on your asset window. There'll be a little lightning bolt when a structure goes into low power, which indicates that it might go abandoned soon. You get about a 24-hour warning before it goes abandoned. Keep an eye on what your structures are. Also, there's no such th <laughs> there's no such thing as uh, as outposts in Nullsec anymore. All outposts were converted into these structures which were then either destroyed, torn up, or maybe some of them are already there. So if you had stuff in NullSec before, even if it was in an outpost, it is likely now either in asset safety in some low sec system, the, the cl closest low sec system to wherever it was, or it's gone, gone. So beware, you know, uh, be, be aware of, of what kind of commitment you're putting into NullSec in particular, because there's no guarantee that you're going to be able to extract things that easily out of it. And these structures can get blown up. They can be blockaded. We've seen people betray their own people and pull the fuel. So that way they can sell the structure to the enemy or whatever. Uh, it's, eh, you know, it's EVE. It's still EVE Online. Structures are incredibly useful. They're incredibly powerful. I'm not going to go into the, too many details about all of the different pros and cons of structures. Just realize that now they are more destructible and... Assets in asset safety can now be at risk by going abandoned. They also made it so the capital ships could be built again. For, for a couple of years, it was basically prohibitively expensive to build capital ships. All right. Speaking of more updates, we have the agency. The agency. A lot of older players don't know about the agency. The agency is now your go-to source for information about where things are in game. Just to go over it super quickly, we have everything from all of your agent finders and missions and all that sort of stuff. We have incursions, faction warfare, uh, fobs, abyssal dead space, anomalies, signatures, all that kind of stuff, right? Like asteroid belts. If you want to find out where something is, if you want to see where a rock is, you come here. You can see every single belt in the game. You can see what kind of rocks spawn there, right? You can look at anomalies. You can see anomalies within the area. You can see anomalies up to one jump away. Uh, otherwise, you see just blank, like, I don't know. Um, same with normal anomalies. So there's a lot of information now in the agency. Get to learn to love it. It is particularly useful in knowing where things are other places. Like, for instance, uh, one of the ones that a lot of people don't know is that in Faction Warfare, you can actually now check the status and the plexes in any given system. 
if I want to see what's going on right now or so in, uh, let's call it Nisawa, I can see, oh, look, look at all those plexes right now. That implies to me that no one's in Nisawa running it, right? Pinecaso, you can kind of see here he probably is being run more, maybe. But yeah, you can see it from anywhere. In fact, I can go, uh, I can say, okay, I only want to see front lines. And now I can go, well, there's Pine, there's Hazmi, there's Suj, there's Nena. Right? So the agency is extremely valuable for getting information. In addition to that, you can also find a bunch of videos to help you out. You've got scanning, you've got wormholing, and then there's all these combat ones. Oh my god, these are so good. Check this out. ECM prevents its target from establishing a lock on anything other than its target successfully ECM jamming it. That's also changed, by the way. ECM no longer causes you to not be able to lock anything. You can now always lock back the thing that is jamming you. Energy neutralizers. I like this thing, like a uh, miss mis missile application. You can see. You can really see how the application works here, right? Like this thing's smaller than the explosion and faster, so it's halfway out of there. This one's all the way in and takes up most of the circle, so it's going to take most of the damage. Really cool stuff. Next, Sinos. Let's say you got your interdiction nullified ship, your Tengu, destroyed. You got all mad. You found out that interdiction nullification is a thing. So then you go back. You get it. You get your Tengu again. You come back. You go to light your Sino to let you jump your, uh, your Dread. And oh shit, doesn't work. It is now true that only Force Recons and Black Ops are allowed to light standard, standard Sinosaural fields. Yeah, that's extremely restricting, <laughs> in case you haven't noticed. It is no longer true that a capital ship can just sit there with a hard Sino on it and light it for whatever they want. You actually will need a dedicated Sino ship there on field to, like, decloak and then light the Sino. So if we see here, we can see that only Force Recon ships and Black Ops are allowed to use. And that's only Force Recon ships, so that's only the cloaking Recon ships that are allowed to use it. Not even all recon ships. Uh, so pretty much just those ships, the Arazu, the Falcon, the Pilgrim, and the Rapier are the ones that mostly light Sinos. Black Ops technically can. However, there is also the Covert Sino, as it used to, as it is, which those can be, uh, those can be lit by anything with a Covert Ops cloak. So here we have the Strategic Cruiser again. You've got Blockade Runner, Stealth Bomber, Prospect, Force Recon, Covert Ops, Black Ops, etc. Anything that can have a Covert Ops cloak can also light a Covert Ops Sino. And then finally, they, they came out with a new Sino to make up for this change called the Industrial Sino. The Industrial Sino can be used by any hauler, blockade runner, deep space transport, or the Venture. Uh, although the Venture does need fitting mods or uh, like cargo expanding mods in order to even fit enough ozone to light it. But you technically can. However, the only things that are allowed to jump through to this thing are jump freighters, rope walls, and it doesn't say this here, but sneaky sneaky, black ops. So black ops can also jump to an industrial sino field generator. So if you see an industrial sino, it might be a uh, jump freighter, it might be a rope wall, or it might be a black ops. So uh, beware of that. But yeah, there is significantly more restriction on what can and cannot be a sino anymore. That said... They did add a Sinosaural beacon. So now you no longer have to actually, like, bring a Sino ship. You can actually carry an invisible structure. No. You can carry one of these mobile Sino beacons, which, ca uh, which are, uh, let's see, how big are they? 400 M3, so totally doable. You drop it and it and it lights a Sino for you. It's it's just a structure. Likewise, there's also a covert one. So that's Sinos and Capitals. Next, Project Discovery. Uh, Project Discovery is citizen science. We've now gone through three different iterations, and the current iteration is based on COVID nineteen. So the way this works is that you uh, open up Project Discovery and you can 
basically identify cellular structures. You get points. Uh, you get a bunch of uh, the skin you get is biosecurity responder skin. Um, and if you get high enough ranks, you can get Concord ships up to and including the Marshal at rank 500. So uh, it's a good way to make some extra money. There are limited turn ins per day uh, based on whether or not you're Alpha or Omega, uh, which is paid or not. Um, but it is a good way, like if you're mining or just sitting around bored somewhere, gate camping. It's a good way to get a little bit of extra money, especially as a newer player. You do get better rewards at level 20, uh, level 25 as an Omega and beyond. Also, we have new Heraldry. Heraldry is through the Paragon system. Paragon is a new group uh, made by Evermore, which is the former Interbus Corporation. Heraldry has is basically a new way to customize our ships. Right now, Heraldry is still very, very limited. There's only really one kind of Heraldry. But it's also very, very new. Oh, yeah, there's new hangers, by the way. So you can see, like, this is my ship. But you can also see, hey, look, there's my corporation logo. It's right there. That's really cool. It also is right here. You also can, uh, I also have a, an alliance logo. But our alliance logo isn't done yet. So, But you can see, like, I have an alliance logo on the side. So most of the time, the, the corporation logo is in the front and the back. And the alliance logos are on the side. Um... Now, you buy these through Evermark point, uh, Evermarks, which are like, uh, I call them Everbucks. And the way you get those is by turning in ships to the Evermar uh, uh, the, the Paragon agent. And there's a Paragon station in every trade hub and a few extras. So what this means is, is that especially if you uh, are like a newer player, or just want to make a little bit of extra money, you can have a huge markup by just selling ships in the Paragon stations, particularly Exploration T1 frigates, Destroyers, the Venture, and Basic Mining Barges. Those are the things that they ask for, and people will pay out the nose. I've paid a million isk for a single Venture, just because I'm too lazy to go get one. And we're talking about things that are in the same system. You don't even need to buy them. You can just buy them, or you don't even need to build them, rather. You just buy them in Paragon, or in the normal trade hub, haul them over to Paragon and put them up for sale and they sell and you make tons of money, like a million and a half for a destroyer or whatever, right? This has made it so that T1 production, especially that low end T1 production, which by the way, the industry changes made cheaper, not more expensive, contrary to popular belief. You know, it's a good way to be able to make money in spite of the fact, you know, T1 is normally not very profitable, but at least on smaller scales, you can make a lot of money uh, this way through the Paragon stations. Or you can just turn them in and get cool heraldry yourself. There's more heraldry that's going to be coming. Uh, so, you know, saving up Paragon points is also probably a good idea. Basically, if you think about it, Paragon points or the Evermarks are effectively Paragon's LP store, right? So, cool. That about covers it for, like, the newer updates. So let's talk about... The Triglavian Collective. These recordings released by Concord show the capture of a heavily damaged ship found drifting a few days ago in the system of Rainilles. No information has been released on the whereabouts or the fate of its crew, but within hours of being boarded, the ship was towed to the Concord Directive Enforcement Department headquarters in Ulai. There it remained quarantined outside the station for 48 hours before it was deemed safe to dock. Little is known about the crew or the builders of the ship at this time except the name Triglavian, possibly connected to the frequent occurrence of the number three in their designs. For the past month, damaged drifter fleets have been mysteriously emerging around various jump gates in New Eden. Appearing in previously unseen numbers, these drifter fleets have been nicknamed Death Balls by Capsuleers. Passive unless provoked, the drifter ships are heavily damaged after some unknown engagements. This has been the cause of speculation about who or what damaged those ships. The Arataka Research Consortium has been the leading element in the drifter investigations, mercilessly group, attacking them at every Hi, opportunity. Dutch. While these unprovoked attacks on the drifters have raised controversy, they have also been justified as they have provided clues to what has been happening to the drifter fleets. Trinary data vaults have been salvaged from the drifter wrecks. The data they hold is partly corrupted and believed to be Triglavian. 
The Arataka Research Consortium has been quite successful in extracting fragmented footage from this data and stitching it together. The footage shows drifters engaging Triglavian ships. It is due to these efforts and consequent questions raised by capsuleers that Concord has finally come forward to shed some light on these events. In the short amount of time since its capture, the Triglavian ship has provided Concord with a wealth of information. Equipped with what has been named a filament device, it allows cruiser-sized ships to enter what Professor Mayer of Concord Deep Space Research calls abyssal dead space. After observing energy spikes spread across New Eden, he has theorized that these are potential entry points to self-sustained pockets of space and time, abyssal dead space. In a daring experiment, an Enforcer-class cruiser was fitted with the filament device to test this theory. Upon activation, the ship instantaneously opened up and entered one of the countless millions of abyssal dead space pockets. This experiment confirmed Professor Mayer's theories, and as also predicted, the entry point closed behind the traveling ship, removing all hope of rescue in case of emergency. Initial observations of the pocket showed that it was surrounded by a harsh flux of space-time. Any ship venturing too far from its center would be crushed by the gravitational forces. Hazardous phenomenon were also detected within the pocket, requiring careful navigation to avoid damage or even destruction of the ship if flying into or too close to these hazards. Almost immediately, the expedition came under attack from three Triglavian ships. Frigate-sized, the vessels were easily identified as Triglavian by the distinctive sphere of energy. This sphere is in fact an engine for a weapon called Entropic Disintegrator, operated completely differently from any existing capsuleer weaponry, it needs a baseline of capacitor to initiate a continuous beam of energy aimed at its target. Initial damage inflicted is limited, but quickly its energy levels ramp up, increasing its damage capability significantly. Once it reaches full capacity, its damage output is higher than any other known weapons of similar size. The Concorde cruiser received considerable damage before managing to destroy the attacking frigates, but due to the damages sustained, communications with the ship became sporadic throughout the remainder of the expedition. With no way to turn around to safety, the crew had no choice but to press on, going deeper into the dead space. Traveling through at least three pockets via what looks like some sort of transportation gates, 12 minutes after entering the abyssal dead space, the last transmission was received from the expedition. Engaged once again by ships of Triglavian design, this time the cruiser was clearly outmatched by the larger vessels. While fragmented, it seems the Concorde cruiser tried desperately to limit the damage received by the entropic disintegrators by repeatedly trying to move out of their range before their damage output reached maximum. But since the safe area within the pocket is limited, it kept getting cornered by the Triglavian ships. Each time the cruiser was forced to make another run past the Triglavians, it took incredible damage whenever any of the beams managed to reach its optimal output. Eventually, the cruiser hull was breached, and a fraction of a second later, its signal was lost. Data from the expedition is still being analyzed, but preliminary findings show that the cruiser traveled through three distinct pockets that all shared similar environments. It is believed that the gate seen in the third pocket would have provided a safe passage back to the point where the cruiser entered the abyssal dead space. What is interesting is that the footage collected from the drifter wrecks in the past weeks showed at least five different forms of environments, which clearly indicates that more is yet to be discovered. Furthermore, the footage also shows drifters engaging Triglavian ships in the abyssal dead space, so it is only safe to assume that drifters will very likely be encountered in future expeditions. Another interesting observation. All right, I'm going to pause there, and we're going to talk about what we've, what we've heard so far. So basically, the Triglavian Collective is a new race, or a new empire, I should say, in EVE Online. They are actually an ancient empire that has been lost in abyssal dead space since the time of the first or second Jovian Empire, so thousands of years, and have recently been rediscovered. The race has its own uh, ship line that is pretty fleshed out at this point. They have a full line of frigate, destroyer, cru a cruiser, logi cruiser, destroyer, battleship, dreadnought, as well as a T2 assault frigate, command destroyer, logistics cruiser, 
and heavy assault cruisers. So pretty good setup. Uh, they're very pretty ships. And as it mentions, they have that entropic disintegrator. Entropic disintegrators start out a little bit lower than other weapon systems, but ramp up every single cycle that they're able to be used continuously. They have no fall off, however. So if you get outside of your optimal, your laser shuts off. You have to restart the entire process of ramping once again. Uh, so these are really fun, really strong uh, ships that do require Omega and are a little bit harder to fly than normal ships, but are very, very fun. In particular, the Kikimora is very popular. Um, I personally am a big fan of the Iki Tursa. They are a bit expensive most of the time, but the way that you get these things is that the everything that you need to build the... Uh, these ships, other than the basic materials or minerals, comes from the Abyss, okay? So the Abyss is a three-room timed instance dungeon where you're given basically three different semi-randomized challenges where you can fight Rogue Drones, Triglavians, Drifters, Concord, uh, Sancha, Angels, or uh, the Drifters. I don't know if I mentioned that one already. Um, or Rogue Drones. Hey, whatever. Uh, you complete the three different challenges by killing everything inside of it. That unlocks the door. There's one uh, loot box per room with additional extra loot kind of along the edges that you could go after if you want to. You have 20 minutes to complete all three of these challenges. If, you, if your ship is destroyed or you run out of time, you, your ship, your pod, all of its modules, everything is destroyed completely and goes away. Uh, so it is a very high risk, high reward. However, since it is instanced, other people cannot mess with you while you're actually in the abyss. Uh, they can get you as you're coming back out, but while you're in the abyss, it is 100% focused on that. Uh, the ships in the abyss, uh, the Triglavian ships, are pretty close to, to real normal players or whatever. Like, So they're not like super hard ships per se. Uh, but they do offer interesting challenges for the people. There's plenty of videos about the Abyss. That's a whole huge thing. It's like one of the big PVEs now. I strongly recommend it. I build a che cheat sheet about it. Uh, there's plenty more resources. I'll let you guys look that up. But uh, for now, just realize that there's a Triglavian Collective. They have Disintegrators. Um, they get it. They come from the Abyss. And they have a new weapon system. I think that about covers it so far. Let's keep going. Observation made during the expedition were readings of high concentrations of biotech that is- To answer your question though, uh, in a more direct way, the number one ship in the abyss is usually the Gila. So it's, they're, it's that, they're that strong. Been named Mutaplasmids. They're also similar to found faction, in the captured yeah. Triglavian cruiser. Concord researchers have been experimenting with the substance and discovered it can have immense but unpredictable effects on existing technology. In the first experiment, mutaplasmids were allowed to bond with a standard micro warp drive, resulting in vastly improved performance and reduced capacity. Sorry, thank you. Existing technology. In the first experiment, mutaplasmids were allowed to bond with a standard micro warp drive, resulting in vastly improved performance and reduced capacitor need while taking some penalty in the form of power consumption. When conducting the exact same experiment again, the results were completely different. Performance decreased while also seeing increased capacitor and power requirements. Subsequent testing has yielded everything from extremely positive to extremely negative results on the modules tested. Once the mutaplasmids have bonded to the modules, then these changes become irreversible, which makes use of the substance a risky gamble. But it is obvious that if this material can be harvested in large quantities, then it is set to revolutionize current space technology. This is Alton Havery reporting for The Scope. Okay, so uh, mutaplasmids are a new way of, I, I've heard people call it enchanting, but it basically allows you to randomly edit or uh, modify a module or a drone. This is an enduring micro warp drive that's been modified by uh, a, a decayed mutaplasmid. All right, so it went from 280 to 241 uh, activation. It went from 505 to 651 uh, maximum velocity. It went from 500 to 453 signature radius. However, the fitting went from 
75 to 89, and from 1250 to 1371. So more fitting, but better overall, right? And that's just an enduring one. You can actually get like, you could even do it with an officer mod, but there's plenty of opportunity for uh, the rolls to go bad, right? Like this is, this was one that was selected from, you know, maybe dozens of, of, of rolls that were made. It's just a cool way to customize your stuff and allows for some pretty insane things to be made. Um, you know, really, really long webs, really, really good, uh, well-fitting uh, modules that uh, couldn't fit otherwise. And there are three different tiers of mutoplasmids. There's decayed, there's gravid, and there's unstable. And that basically modifies how much it can go up or down, right? So unstable is like the most uh, risk versus reward. It can have the highest highs and the lowest lows. Likewise, a module is, or each mutoplasmid is tied to a specific module type. So you'd be, get like a webbing mutoplasmid and that'll work on any web, but it has to be a web. And then there'll be another mutoplasmid that's like plates. Another mutoplasmid that'll be ancillary shield wrappers. Uh, most of the mutoplasmids are gotten from the abyss and the different weathers of the abyss will control what kind of rewards that you get. What do you mean by weathers in the abyss? Well, there's actually five different kinds of abyss. Uh, again, don't going, not going to get too deep into it, but there are uh, darks, exotics, gammas, electricals, and firestorms that provide different bonuses and resistance penalties based on which weather you're in. So you customize your ship and, uh, and each kind of weather plays a little bit differently. But depending on which weather you do, you get different rewards. So if you do like, I think it's exotic, you get like webs. If you get firestorm, you get plates, etc. So that's the abyss. And that was pretty cool. One year after the abyss. Heads up, I'm activating the abyssal filament. If you need to reload kinetic ammo and group weapons, do it now. Kinetic ammo? What are you talking about? I brought thermal. I got thermal ammo with me. Stole me I got thermal! He oh, said thermal! On. We went over this. It's super simple. It's a dozen ships. We kill them, grab the loop, and have to execute. All right, guys. Keep your stuff together. Here we go. In 2019, the Triglavian Collective invaded New Eden. They began simply by probing and, and prodding at different areas, going in, extracting resources, experimenting on the local space-time before being fought off and disappearing yet again to attack another place. After a year, 
they changed their tactics. Things escalated. Through the mist, I saw a figure emerge. And with it, a darkness advanced, devouring and reshaping. And as the sunlight cast its final, everlasting shadow, I felt a chill rise from the abyss and eclipse the world. Proving Hunter is still there. In 2020, the uh, Triglavians upped their game and began invading. What followed was a series of fights over the very stars of New Eden itself. Systems could either be taken by the tri by pro Triglavian forces or pro Edencom forces, depending on what the players were doing. And one by one, we fought over the stars of New Eden. Stars that were blue or of type G5 yellow were able to proceed to uh, the, the next stage. Other systems that were taken by one side or the other that could not proceed became what was known as minor victories. The ones that could proceed, however, became either final liminalities or Edencom fortresses. Final liminalities, once a system became first liminality, which was when the Triglavians began to capture it, the system went from high, or became low sec, regardless of where it started. Once it hit final liminality, the system became null sec, regardless of what it was originally. Once 27 star systems was, was captured by the Triglavian Collective, the invasion ended and Pakvin was formed. The war in the Delphite, or die. The, part. the Imperium has in recent years built up formidable defenses yeah, yeah, yeah. by constructing a Eden. Empires of New Eden are slowly adjusting to the aftermath of the Stargate disruptions that severed the links to Triglavian-occupied systems and led to the formation of a new region called Poshban. It is widely believed that the creation of an artificial region consisting of the 27 New Eden systems conquered by the invaders was the final act in the Triglavian campaign. Despite the cessation of invasions, Edencom's Provost Marshal Cassia Valkanir has secured ongoing funding for the organization from Concord and the four core empires, reiterating the need for vigilance. New Eden's people have suffered many grievous blows and fought hard throughout the invasion. I have witnessed the strength of our fighters, the loyalty of our supporters, the persistence of our collective defense with my own eyes. I am proud of all of our people. Yes, civilization has lost territory to the inhuman Triglavian invaders. Yes, we have lost many billions to naked aggression, treachery, and occupation. We must look to preserve what we have defended and remain vigilant. Even still, we cannot forget those who remain under the heel of the invaders. Edencom will continue to fight for their recovery and liberty. I welcome and deeply appreciate the continuing commitment of the Concord member states to the struggle. Edencom's best minds in the fields of exploration, science, and military logistics are continuing to work on an effort to map the alterations to the space-time topology of the invaded systems and New Eden in general. 
Though it is gravely dangerous, Edencom's forces continue to gather data on posh fund systems, disrupt triglavian operations, and seek means to navigate the region more effectively. Evacuation of the billions still trapped remains out of reach, but it is a highly political priority for the empires. For their part, the Triglavians have rapidly moved to assert even deeper control over the systems and worlds of Poshpan. Having divided the spoils between their three clades, there are disturbing and clear signs of vast changes being wrought in space and on the planets of the occupied systems. The Triglavians are opposed by Edencom, but also by resurgent drifter incursions, with hostile and highly advanced rogue drones also making their presence felt. As so often, the Triglavian spokesperson Zoria Triglav has broadcast a message asserting their dominion and apparently encouraging the treacherous Kybernauts, or Camp Saliers, that have gone over to the Triglavian side. We are Zoria Triglav. We speak for the communication between outside Israel. We continue the work of sublimation. Subornest Kybernauts, hear the words of our prayer. Heed them. Totality and the weaving of portion. The flow of the has been anchored in the domain of portion. Stabilization of the ancient domains proceeds. Cladistic dominion in glorification has been involved. Clouds within the struggle have imminence. Eminence in their cries. Proving fitness to join the floor shall be glorified. Shall be glorified. Kyber not proving access and force must shall be glorified. So Kyber not are exhorted to, to extirpate force must elements. We continue the work of sublimation of force must flow. We speak for, we speak the, for the convocation of trade law outside this channel. We are Zoria Trigla. Zoria Trigla. All right, so let's take a step back. What what are we looking at here? So while we were fighting, uh, the forces on behalf of known space. A department of Concord known as Aegis unified the empires together in a single navy known as Edencom. You probably heard that name in there and listened to the leader, Cassia Valkanir. So Edencom is the United Efforts. It's New Eden Common Defense Initiative. It comprises of agents from all four empires. Why does anything any of this matter to you? Systems are now either uh, systems can be Triglavian Minor Victories. Edencom Minor Victories, or Edencom Fortresses. If it is any of those three, that means that those forces defend and live in that system. You'll get a warning before you try to jump into them. They will be able to put up their own gate guns. They have roaming fleets. They guard the asteroid belts. And they can put up a special effect beacon on top of the sun that modifies everybody within the system. In, on the Edencom side, the, the beacon will increase the tank type of the racial owner, the Ewar of the racial owner, and uh, increase mining by about 10%. On the Triglavian side, it'll increase remote reps, cut your locks in half, and slow down your warp speed. So within those systems, those effects are in place. But it's the gate camps that are really nasty. Now, by default, you are neutral to Edencom. So if you've never done anything about this, then Edencom forces will not attack you. Triglavians will. Triglavians will attack you on site. If you stay on grid with their were posts, which are their towers, it takes about 10 seconds for them to spool up. But once they do, they will blap you. And they will. And these ships, these guys, these forces will pod you as well. They are very fast locking rats too. And they're pretty smart and they fly as a fleet. 
They can call upon backup, etc. If you attack Triglavian forces, you lose Triglavian standings and gain Edencom standings. If you attack Edencom uh, forces, you lose Edencom standings and you gain Triglavian standings. If you gain more than 3.0 with either of them, then they become blue to you and they will defend you and logistic you if the, they happen to be on grid with you, both Edencom and the Triglavians. However, there is a way to get your standings fixed once and for all, because a lot of people get killed accidentally in Triglavian minor victory systems because the Triglavians are hostile by default. But in Pakvin, which is the special 27 systems that the Triglavian Collective took, there are new Rogue Drone and Drifter forces. If you go into uh, Pakvin and you kill Rogue Drones, even a single Rogue Drone, you will gain enough standings to raise Triglavian up while still raising Edencom up. And so now you'll be neutral to both of them and neither side will ever attack you. It is very much worthwhile to get together with a couple of people, grab some sniper corms, head into uh, Pakvin and try to kill some rogue drones at the very least. There's also sites and stuff that you can run while in there uh, to do the same thing. Pakvin itself is like a super wormhole. It's 27 systems with no local. It does have structures, but your uh, stations, but your access to the stations are limited to your Triglavian standings. The three home systems at the, so at the center of each of the cries, which are like the territories of the collective, uh, have a gate that can only be entered with a high security status, or sorry, a high status with with the Triglavians. So here we can see that Kino, Archie, and Nyarja are the home systems, but all the rest of these can be traveled by anybody. All of the Stargates that used to be connected to these systems have been cut off. What this means is, since Nyarja is right here, it means that the, the, tr the distance between Jita to Amar has gone from eight jumps to 45 jumps, I think. The the connection between Jita and Amar have been has been seriously cut off by this change, among other things, right? The, all of these systems basically no longer are connected to the gate network. However, they are still physically located where they are. So, which leads to how you get in and out. You can get in and out either through wormholes or through filaments. There are wormholes that will spawn within a certain range of each of these fil filament or each of these systems. So like within three jumps of any given system. So if you go, there's like 16 different systems that are within three jumps of Veil. Vale. There will be a wormhole in one of those 13, uh, 16 systems that lead to Veil. Vale. Uh, it's like they have inverse statics. And systems that have a connection to Veil, vale, or sorry, to Pakvin, uh, will have Triglavian rats roaming around, attacking people in belts, etc. So beware of that, too. This is another good reason why you want to become positive with the Triglavian Collective as well as Edencom. The other way to get in and out is through filaments. These, there are new, there are things called filaments. There are Nullsec filaments, which we'll get to in a second, but then there's also these Triglavian filaments. There are ingressing and outgressing filaments. There are ingressing filaments for each type of thing. There's like internal system, border system, home system, and for the three different cries, Cry Belez, Cry Be Svarog, and Cry Perun. When you use one, you get tr transported to a random Pakvin system that qualifies as one of those, uh, one of the types that it is designed for. And then there's the extraction, or there's the two ways to get out. out. Devana filament will take you to a random Triglavian minor victory, which can be all over the place in high sec and low sec. Uh, we can see the minor victory systems by going here to the, this is kybernaut.space, by the way. And you can click here, Triglavian minor victory. So these are all the different systems that a Devana system, a Devana filament might lead you to. And then there's the extraction filaments, and the extraction filaments bring you to some pla a place within a few jumps of the Stargate that you uh, were part of. Here is Edencom.space, which is kind of the other side of the coin. They have a lot of good information about uh, on Edencom.space about how to work with Pakvin, how to get in and out of Pakvin, etc., etc. Kybernaut.space was mostly used during the invasion itself. But here, you can see, I can go, look, here is... Harva can connect to Marima, Chara, Patscha, etc. So these are all the different systems that could connect to Harva. So the nice thing about Pakvin is it makes it so that you could actually be in, say, null security space. You can use one of the ingressing filaments to teleport to Pakvin, and then you can use an extraction filament to teleport out of Pakvin. And depending on how lucky you are, you could literally appear two jumps away from Jita, from anywhere outside of wormhole space. These filaments can't be used in wormhole space. There is another kind of filament that can be used that has nothing to do with Pakvin, 
that are known as noise and signal filaments. Those will teleport you to uh, NullSec. So a, no a signal filament will teleport you to a random active system, something that people have been ratting in or something that has been working the system somehow recently. And a noise filament will take you to a random NullSec system, period. So noise filaments are really good if you're trying to find some place to explore. Signal filaments are really good if you're trying to find some place to kill or raid, right? And then you can use these Bachman filaments to come home if you don't want to use wormholes. So lots of new ways of getting around, lots of new options. And this new region that is 27 systems of wormhole space that can be teleported in and out of using these filaments. It's really cool. There's a lot of stuff to it. It's been a long story. But in addition to this, structures and uh, player structures cannot be built in Pockvin. So there, while there were structures there, slowly but surely, all of the structures in Pockvin are being destroyed. Eventually, there will be no structures in Pockvin. And I personally believe that the stabilization of Pockvin will not complete until that happens. Likewise, there were capital ships that were in Losec when, the, when Pockvin formed and therefore are still in Pockvin. There are individual Titans and Dreads and all this stuff like that in, in the Pockvin systems. Now, they could always jump out if they wanted to, but they can never get back in. So each one of those is likewise just as special. Yes, there is no local in Pockvin, just like a wormhole space. And all of them, all, every system in Pockvin have those bonuses to uh, remote reps, reduction in warp speed, and lock times cut in half. All right. Uh, I think that that's, that's a lot of it. There's other things like there's some new techniques like there's uh, now command uh, command destroyers, uh, battleships and ba uh, battle cruisers can have a module now that allows them to jump 100 kilometers straight forward. Well, command destroyers have a module that they can use outside of high sec that will allow them to teleport them and everyone within six kilometers of them that isn't scrammed 100 kilometers. So it's a good way to just grab a bunch of people and move them from point A to point B. Uh, sorry, not everyone, up to 25 people. So you can use it to grab people out of uh, out of their position. You can use it to move your own fleet, et cetera, et cetera. There's plenty of new tactics uh, and whatnot within the game. There's, you know, off-grid boosts have been removed, and now it's on-grid boosts. There's so many new tactical options and stuff like that as well. There's uh, new fitting options, plenty of quality of life changes that have been made, too numerous to count. But I think that that's about it as far as uh, things go, which is good because I have a doorbell. So hold on, I'll be right back. <laughs> Yay, batteries. All right, so uh, that about wraps it up for what has been going on. I hope that this has been useful to you guys uh, and, and that you got at least something out of this as far as things that you may not have known have changed. And hopefully I may have even saved a life or two out there with some of these updates. So as I've shown, like, CCP has put a lot of work into this game over the last few years, going through, making new systems, making really cool new stuff, but also going back and fixing older systems that have always been broken. I can't wait to see you guys out there in EVE with me. If you, uh... oh, there's actually one other huge thing to point out, which is the buddy code. If you have never used it before, if you've been gone, you can now use a buddy code to get a million free skill points unallocated. They actually have made catching up in EVE way easier. They've made it so that you can now extract uh, skill points out of your own brain and sell them on the market. And then you can buy them and inject them into your own brain to get some free or not free, but uh, unallocated SP that you can use. But if you don't want to pay that money, you can get a million free SP which is uh, like 40 days of free-to-play training or like 20 days of, of uh, paid training. And even if you already have an account, as long as you have never used that code before, you can use the link, uh, which should be below, to be able to get those, that free million skill points for yourself. So use that, get in there, get back involved. Uh, you can even pick up the weekend deal pack to be able to get a couple days of Omega to get in there. Or just come on in. It's a free-to-play game now. Come check it out as an alpha. Get involved with Faction Warfare. It's awesome now. Uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And come check out the new changes. There's more to come. I'm very excited. And I will be here to show you it all. But that is it for today. I have been Asherathi. Thank you guys so much for checking this out. Thank you for the viewers, 
for uh, all the people that helped me put together the list in my alliance. Thank you to Convocation of Empyreans. And I'm specifically going to call out, uh, I probably already did this before. So I'm going to just, I'm going to call out Dutch Gunner as my uh, big dude. Uh, Dutch Gunner is keeping together the Aritaka Research Consortium. This dude continually pushes the envelope when it comes to practical application of role play and um, embracing the nature of the universe. Uh, so thank you very much for Dutch Gunner to continuing to help out with Aritaka Research Consortium. If you want to get involved in the deep, deep research of the lore, you should probably hit him up and maybe even consider joining their science research team. Otherwise, if you want to come fight or learn the game, you can join the Convocation of Empyreans. We are here to maximize player engagement with people online and uh, secure the southern half of the war zone for the Galente Federation through our organization of Aderon Robotics. But regardless, I hope to see you out there. I hope that you, that, uh, you come back and have a good time, and this video helps you uh, just a little bit in getting that to be a better experience. So... Thank you very much, especially to my patrons and supporters, especially Abyssus, Aikiwara Zuchan, Aradenika the Queen, Black Rose Noble, Dejat Lamont, Drake, Golden Age Stories, J. Kuhn, LM1, Malik Starfire, Midnight Space Monkey, Not Just Fun, Seeds of Plenty, Serenalin with No Eyes, Siliana Vilesh, Nephilim, Grendel, Zolnex, as well as Evolite and Rid. Thank you guys so much so much these are the people those names are the people that make me be able to do this somebody in chat was like oh my god you need to make sure to wear a seatbelt because like if you go away then no one will be able to figure this stuff out and i don't know if that's necessarily true but let me tell you if you like my work thank these people and if you want to if you want to ensure that my work continues then you can join them on my patreon or by becoming a member or putting out super thanks or super chats on my videos but even if you don't do any of that, just by being here, watching my videos, sharing them around, and helping people find them uh, is huge when it comes to uh, not only just expanding the channel, but growing our overall understanding and literacy of the game, which, given a social game like this, only improves the quality of the game overall. So, once again, thank you guys for coming on this journey with me, and I... I have been Ashrothi, the voice of New Eden. I've been playing this game since 2010, talking about it since 2012, and I'm here to put even to eh, I'm here to put even to context for you, my fellow Empyreans. On that note, I've been Ashrothi. Thank you for joining, and I'll see you in space. Also, like the video. <laughs>